this is going to be a First Chronicles overview. And this book of the Bible has 29 chapters, 942 verses, and 20,369 words. And first you need to see that First Chronicles is like a commentary on First and Second Samuel. And mainly Second Samuel. So you're going to read about the life of David again like you did back in Second Samuel. And it's like when you read the Gospels, you see some of the same events in the life of Jesus throughout the Gospels, and you will get further information about a certain story or miracle in one of the Gospels that you didn't get in the other Gospel. So the same is true for First and Second Samuel with First Chronicles, because you'll get some information about the life of David that you didn't get in Second Samuel. So, 1 Chronicles shows you things from God's viewpoint, whereas Samuel and Kings shows you things from the prophet's viewpoint. And so, here's a simple breakdown of the chapters. In 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through 9, you have the gene genealogies, tracing the royal line. And then in chapter 10, you, you see the end of Saul's reign. And then in chapter 11... Through 21, you have the reign of David. And then in 22 through 29, you have the preparations for building of the temple. So in chapters 1 through 9, you have many, many man's least favorite part of the Bible. The average Christian will not read the Bible because of chapters like these. However, some of the most interesting little verses are found in the pages of these chapters of these genealogies here. So let's go through chapters 1 through 9 and pick out some of the verses that stood out. In chapter 1 and verse 10, you have Nimrod. It says he began to be a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, as you know, Nimrod was a wicked man. But the verse shows a man can be mighty. So he's busy. So Nimrod was mighty, but he was busy concerning evil. The Bible talks about evil workers. Some men are more busy for the devil than Christians are for Jesus Christ. Nimrod would have been mighty for the devil. So, if the devil has men that are z zealous for him and mighty when it comes to serving him, this should encourage you to be mighty for the Lord God. And it says, Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's what the people said about him. And I've always kind of wondered, did they mean he was mighty before the Lord in the sense that he was mightier than the Lord? A lot of men will place certain men above the Lord God. For example, they call Michael Jordan the black Jesus. They give men like LeBron James the name King James. Things like that. Men are always putting men over God. Just like they said, Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. That may not have been what they meant, but I guarantee you that there were some men that looked up to him so much they were putting him ahead of God. That's one thing you don't want to do is put men ahead of God. And in chapter 1 and verse 29, you have a guy named Peleg. And it says, in his days, the earth was divided. So this could mean the people of the earth were divided. But it also could mean the land masses were divided into the continents that they're in now. And you can read about Nimrod and Peleg in the book of Genesis. But in chapter 2, you have a man named Ur, who was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord slew him. And this goes to show you that God kills. God is a God of wrath. And this shows you that we should fear the Lord. When you do evil, fear God. And in chapter 2 and verse 7, you have Achan, or Achar gets the horrible privilege of being called the troubler of Israel. One mistake you make can cause horrible consequences for other people. And you know the story about Achan in the book of Joshua and what he did and how he it started with a look. He saw it, he lusted after it, and he took it. And that's how sin plays out in your life. And one sin that you do can have horrible consequences on other people. For example, one night of getting drunk, you can get in a car 
hit somebody head on and have that person in hell before the day's over. You can start with a look, looking at another woman, commit adultery with that woman, and it wrecks your entire life, it wrecks your marriage, it wrecks the life of your kids. They're gonna have to grow up in a home without their mother and father. So one mistake can cause horrible consequences for other people. Don't be the troubler of your family or your church or anyone else. In chapter four, you have the famous prayer of Jabez. In chapter five, you see the descendants of Reuben. And in verse 18, it says they are skillful in war. If you're a Christian, then you're a natural at spiritual warfare automatically. But you still have to practice. You need to do Bible workouts. You need to read. You need to meditate. You need to memorize. You need to learn something new every day. Don't just stick to the fundamentals. If you're saved, you have a power in you that's already equipped to do spiritual warfare. But you need to be get skillful in war. Every day, get up and read the Bible. Read so many chapters of the Bible a day. Get you some little index cards Write out verses on those index cards and throughout the day memorize those verses. Get you a certain topic every week and study that topic. Get a chapter out of the Bible and study that chapter. Get a book of the Bible like I'm doing here every week and meditate on that book of the Bible. Do your own overview of that book. And this is how you get skillful in war. And then you had to put these things into practice. You need to try to teach them to other people. You need to apply what you've learned to your life and try to live what the Bible's telling you to live. This is how you'll get skillful in war, just like these descendants of Reuben. And then in verse 20, it says, They cried to God in battle, and he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him. So not only do you need to do all these things and practice all these things, but remember the reason why you're doing anything that's good and abstaining from anything that's bad is because you got God. And the reason why you're going to get through anything is because you trust in God. So God was entreated of them because they put their trust in Him. And that's also an important step in your spiritual warfare, trust in the ultimate warrior, which is God Himself. And then in chapter 9 and verse 32, it says, The Kohathites were over the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. Now think about that. If you're a teacher or preacher, then you need to prepare something to give to the people. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Be prepared to do the important task of feeding people the words of God. Many people say, well, I don't have to prepare. I just get up and just God gives me something at that moment. But you need to prepare. You need to study all throughout the week. Don't just expect God to just give you something in that moment. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And then in chapter 10, you have a mighty warrior and king by the name of Saul who meets his tragic end. In 1 Chronicles 10, 3 through 6, it says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was wounded of the archers. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his house died together, and all his house died together. So Saul at one point was little in his own sight, back when he began to reign. However, he got puffed up and prideful. And notice he falls on his own sword. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Saul got puffed up, and he fell. He literally fell on his own sword. So literally in this case, being prideful is just like killing yourself. The devil would love to have your head and your armor as a trophy. He would love to be able to get you to sin against God and strip you of your spiritual armor and look what they did to Saul look what the enemies of God did to Saul in first chronicles 10 9 through 10 it says and when they had stripped him they took his head and his armor and sent 
into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. See, in, in Ephesians 6, it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. The devil would love to have you lifted up in pride so he can knock your head off and strip you of your armor. And then the enemies of God can strap you in the house of their gods. Because when you sin against God before a bunch of lost people, and you're defeated in front of a bunch of lost people, you're giving them, you're giving their gods a victory, not over God Himself, but over your in your spiritual battle that you're having. And when you sin against against God in front of lost people, you're giving them occasion to blaspheme. You're giving them an occasion to say that your God isn't that great and things like that. That's why you always want to keep your testimony. You want to live a godly life in front of people. You don't want to be prideful like Saul because the devil will strip you of your armor. And that's why it says in 1 Timothy 3, 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. In chapter 11, David is anointed king. 1 Chronicles 11, verse 3 says, Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. So you have the death of Saul, a type of the Antichrist. And then right after that you have the crowning of David, who's a type of Jesus Christ. And that's how it will be. Jesus Christ is going to come back at the second coming and he's going to do away with the Antichrist, the people's choice. The Antichrist is going to be cast into the lake of fire and then Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne with a crown in his kingdom. So you see how the Bible lines up. Jesus Christ comes back first, gets rid of the Antichrist, sits on the throne in his kingdom. Saul, a type of Antichrist, the people's choice, is, gets falls on the sword, and then you have the crowning of David, a type of Jesus Christ. And then you also have a list of David's mighty men in chapter 11, and these are true war warriors. These should um, show you what you need to be like in your Christian life, and also shows you a glimpse of what you'll be like in your glorified body, except you'll be much faster and stronger than all these men rolled into one. But these are true warriors, brave, tough and willing to fight willing to go on for god and in jeremiah 48 10 it says cursed be he that doeth the work of the lord deceitfully and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood the christian life is a fight even though we don't use physical weapons to spite to fight our spiritual battles we have the word of god as our weapon so let's see these characteristics of these mighty men in chapter 11 and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce all these names right. They're pretty tough. But Jeshobim and Hekmonite, the chief of the captains, he lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. That's incredible. And then the, the, another guy in 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 21. And Abisha, the, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three. For lifting up his spear against 300, he slew them. And had a name among the three. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, for he was their captain, howbeit he attained not to the first three. So you see, these guys killed 300 at one time. This shows me these men can multitask. He can take on more than one problem at once. And I'm sure all of these 300 were mighty men. So there is probably no chance you could take that many men at once. In your physical body, there's probably no chance you're going to be able to take on 300 men at once. But you can multitask. Some Christians don't get anything accomplished, especially not more than one thing accomplished at once. For example, I have to go to work every day. That's eight hours of my time at least a day. But while I'm doing this, I can listen to audio Bibles. I can listen to preaching. I can listen to teaching and Bible-related stuff on my headphones. While I'm on break, I can read my Bible. I don't just have to be just sitting there staring. I don't have to limit myself to doing one thing at once. If I multitask, I can get a lot done at once. If he can take on 300 men at once with the Lord's help, 
then we can multitask with the Lord's help. Christians are just wasting too much time. They don't want to take on anything, let alone more than one thing at once. But the Bible talks about redeeming the time. And I believe that if you start multitask, I believe multitasking is key when it comes to learning the Bible because you're going to have to spend hours and hours in the Bible. And if you don't do this while you're at work or at the doctor's office or waiting on somebody in the car or something like that, you're wasting precious time that you're never going to get back. But be able to take on more than one thing at once. Just like these men were able to take on 300 men at once. And now this next guy in 1 Chronicles 11, 12 through 14. It says, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, who was one of the three mighties. He was with David at past Demim, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle where was a parcel of ground full of barley. And the people fled from before the Philistines, and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. So these two show us that you will sometimes be outnumbered. But Paul says in Romans 8.31, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So you're going to have to take on more than one thing at once. You're going to have to take on more than one enemy at once. You're going to be outnumbered. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Then in verse 22 it says, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzal, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And this is just an awesome visual when you read this. It's like something you'd see in a movie. And I... Back when I watched movies, when I was in the world, I remember scenes like this in movies. But you have these lion-like men of Moab. And I imagine these are some scary-looking guys, much more intimidating than Mike Tyson and Tyson Fury and Dante Wilder and all these little punks that you have today. But what an epic, epic fight scene it would be to see Benaiah go up against two lion-like men of Moab. This would make a lot of money on pay-per-view. And as a Christian, you probably can't take on a lion or lion-like men or the tough men of today. But you will face men who are brute beasts, men of the devil. And you will have to know the book to be able to handle them. And a lot of false teachers are really smart. A lot of God-haters are very intelligent. You will have to know your weapon to defeat them in battle. And look what else he did. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. So imagine this regular sized man, most likely, fighting someone huge like Taco Fall. That guy that plays for the Boston Celtics. Except with much bigger muscles and raised as a fighter from his youth. That is the type of guys that Benaiah was taking on. And then in chapter 13, you see a more detailed description about Uzzah and properly moving the ark. They were supposed to bear it on their shoulders with staves. As it says in 1 Chronicles 15, 15, and the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon as Moses commanded according to the word of the Lord. But Uzzah touched the ark. And something interesting is that it looks like David and Israel are sincere. They're obviously sincere because they're playing before God with all their might on their, on their harps and their psalteries and their timbrels and cymbals with trumpets here in 1 Chronicles 13. They're sincere about the ark, but yet they do it the wrong way. Uzzah touches it and the Lord sl slays him right there. It says, and he smote him because he put his hand on the ark, and there he died before God in 1 Corinthians 13, 10. So God was still mad because they didn't follow what he said in his word. So you can be sincere and sincerely wrong if you don't follow what the word of God says. And even though David just had had a great victory by becoming king, he still sought God when the Philistines came against him. He didn't try to do, his, do it on his own strength in 1 Corinthians 14. And in 14.10, the Lord tells him that he's going to deliver them into his hand. So if you just keep seeking God, God will keep giving you victory. 
And in chapter 15, they moved the ark to Jerusalem properly. And this is a great victory. Most likely, if you keep seeking God, God's going to give you victory. He'll let you go through tr trouble. He'll let you lose some battles, most likely, just to keep you humble. But most of the time, if you seek God, things will turn out like you want them to turn out. And David still had obstacles in his life because of the women he chose to marry. Your spouse can be the greatest encouragement or the worst enemy you have to doing the Lord's work. And Michael was a discouragement to David. As it says in 1 Chronicles 15, 29, And it came to pass as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out at a window, saw King David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. She didn't care for him rejoicing in the Lord. This is why you shouldn't just marry a Christian, but a Christian who acts like a Christian. And in Psalms 105, Psalms 96, and Psalms 106 will match David's songs of thanks in chapter 16. In chapter 17, David wanted to build a temple for God. However, God objected and said his son would build the temple, which would be Solomon. And David didn't get angry over this, but rather started preparing the way for Solomon to do this work. And this shows why David is a man after God's own heart. He didn't have to get glory for himself for building the temple. He wanted glory for God, so he was willing for the man after him to build it. And he was willing to prepare a way for him to do it. So don't worry if you don't win everybody around you. Just continue to soften everyone around you so you can prepare the way for the man that's coming next to win them over. And David goes on to have more victories in battle in 1 Chronicles 18. And in 1 Chronicles 18, 5 through 8, it says, And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadarezer, king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria, Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought gifts. Thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were the, on the servants of Hadarezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Likewise from Tibhath and from Chun, cities of Hadarezer, brought David very much brass, wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass. Notice, like I said, he is accumulating things that his son will use to build the temple, preparing the way for those that follow after him. The best thing you can do is leave something behind that will help the Christians who are coming up. Even if it is something little like a Bible full of notes and references that you collected over the years of serving the Lord, I have about five Bibles I'm marking up and writing on to pass on to my kids and others. Do something that will last after you're gone. And then in 1 Chronicles 20, in verse 1, it says, David tarried in Jerusalem. And this is when he committed the sin with Bathsheba. He committed adultery and basically had her husband murdered. However, Chronicles doesn't mention this. All it mentions is that he tarried at Jerusalem. And I believe that this shows that God forgave him for his sin, which we know he did. And while David has that smudge on his record in the eyes of man, he doesn't have it on his record in the eyes of God. And that's a great thing. Even though David's failure of committing adultery with Bathsheba isn't mentioned in 1 Chronicles, his sin in numbering the people is. In 1 Chronicles 21.1, it talks about how Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And because David did this, God made him choose his punishment in 1 Corinthians 21 as well. And that's where today, you know, many times your parents will let you choose your punishment. And what a horrible thing it is to have to choose from a list a bunch of horrible stuff. But in chapter 22, David begins gathering things for the house of God that would be built under Solomon's reign. So once again, in 1 Chronicles 22, he's continuing to prepare the way for the person that's going to come after him. And that's exactly what we should be doing. We shouldn't be wanting to just have some great legacy where we are the greatest. We should prepare the way for those that come after us. And today the house of God is made up of every born-again believer. You can put in work building the house of God today by winning souls to Jesus Christ and building up other believers who are in the house of God. 
Then in chapter 25, you have David setting up the music and musicians for the temple. In 25, 1, it says, Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and with cymbals. So, today, a lot of emphasis is placed on the music. But music is still an imp important thing in the Bible. And notice it was to give thanks and praise to the Lord. In verse 3 of 1 Chronicles 25, to give thanks and praise to the Lord, not to the singer, not to the people that's up there singing. You need to give praise to the Lord. But on a so-called Christian radio station, I heard one of Kanye West's new songs and the lyrics were closed on Sunday, you're my Chick-fil-A. I mean, how is that Christian? Talking about Chick-fil-A in a song? Whether or not Kanye really got saved is besides the point. He still isn't making godly music. And how, how should that be on a Christian radio station? We're living in a time when people think Kanye's music is Christian music. The most Christian thing they can think of is, is Chick-fil-A being closed on Sunday. But that's the state of Christianity we're in today. But in chapter 26, you have the divisions of the porters, which is the gatekeepers. In chapter 27, you see... Appointing the appointed leaders of the tribes of Israel. And in chapter 28, you'll see David's advice to Solomon. And he's trying to train up Solomon in the way he should go. Even when Solomon's already older, he's still giving advice to Solomon. In chapter 29, you see the death of David. And if great men like David die, this is a reminder that you will die. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So, First Chronicles, this is an excellent book. So many great things in here, even though it's got all those genealogies that people hate. There's so much great things in the Bible. So I encourage you to read this book. I, I encourage you to read all the names. Don't skip over the names. <clears throat> And just see what you can get out of all the little stories and nuggets in this book.